You're looking for what? Yeah, so uh, let me start by uh, well thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to uh, present here our work uh, that has been done uh, partially by my postdoc, uh, Soro Nandi, who just moved from my group to uh, PKS in Dresden. Then uh, with Marco Schmidt, who you know, the organizer here, and Marin Buko, you also probably know, but will uh, talk uh, about his work, I think, tomorrow. So, um, I mean, what we did in, in kind of these two studies was that we were using neural networks uh, as a way to compress a quantum sta state and then try to extract some effective description, you know, some features that we are typically looking from, uh, from those states. Uh, and then, I mean, we applied this principle, uh, for example, to detect uh, different stages of uh, non-equilibrium dynamics to say, I um, mean, whether maybe the simulator that we're dealing with is a bit noisy or maybe even uh, to learn uh, Hamiltonian uh, fr from those states or what uh, we actually um, have at disposal. Uh, and uh, so we assume that what we actually can operate with is only the measurements of uh, uh, local operators performed on those states, and then we were trying to extract uh, all the things that I named. So in this talk, I'll kind of first um, kind of, yeah, let's say put forward or, or tell you about kind of a new measure of local complexity uh, using autoencoders that we um, studied, and then later upgrade this uh, for a Hamiltonian reconstruction. So we all come from a, a kind of more non-equilibrium um, dynamics interested people. So that's what also our, uh, our motivation was, whether we can use neural networks to study such non-equilibrium uh, systems. So uh, what we had in mind was, uh, you know, suppose you start your state in some rather simple, maybe product state, and then you run your uh, evolution with your Hamiltonian um, that is uh, interacting, entangling, uh, and so on. So what will happen to the complexity of, of this state? I mean, of course, I mean, under such an evolution, the complexity of this state uh, will grow. But if we pretend, or maybe that's actually reality from your quantum simulator, if we have access only to some local measurements, so measurements of local operators in such time evolved state, uh, we somehow know that, I mean, after a long time, when the state gets very scrambled, so they essentially most of the information about the initial state is, is gone, and the only things that are still important are only, let's say, energy or information about other conserved quantities in this state. So at that late times, um, it happens that the states, I mean the local complexity or what we can probe with local measurements should be rather uh, simple once again. Namely, I mean what's termed thermalization, what should happen is that for what we are probing, the rest should, uh, you know, serve as a bath and that's why the measurements that we are performing locally should look like coming from some um, like thermal ensemble from some, some, from some statistical description that is now not very complex, but parameterized just with a single parameter, say temperature, or maybe with some additional parameters for additional conserved quantities. And uh, that was kind of what we were interested. So we were asking ourselves, can, can we use neural networks to detect now these different stages of non-equilibrium evolution? For example, this growth of complexity and uh, later um, decay. So uh, the platforms that we, uh, or, or the neural network architecture that we used for this task was autoencoder because it's kind of, I mean, very traditionally used to obtain uh, 
compressed representations in general. So it's a neural network of that type, so, and it's, let's say, um, task, or the goal is to take some initial uh, data and then try to reconstruct it um, by going uh, through a bottleneck. And, and, and we train it in such a way that this reconstruction is as good as possible, but of course it's gonna be successful only once the intrinsic dimension of, of uh, our uh, data is actually, I mean, lower or, or equal to the number of, uh, to the kind of this yeah, number of neurons in the bottleneck. So, so uh, yeah. And, and in that sense, it, by, by checking when this reconstruction is uh, successful and when not, we can actually use it uh, you know, as a way to determine the, the inherent intrinsic dimension of our uh, data set. Okay, that's very general, but what, what is our input? So in our case, uh, each data element will contain measurements of local operators. So say we ha are dealing with spins, so measurement of x, y, z, x, x, let's say all Pauli strings uh, up to some support uh, S. So, and, and kind of the, let's say, dimension of this uh, input element is how many operators we actually uh, measure. And then we'll be checking, you know, if we perform this measurement in certain state, I mean, is this state parameterizable with some smaller number of parameters? Is it, in that sense, kind of compressible uh, locally? And, um, and uh, as I already said, the network is uh, first trained on a subset of um, realization measurements. So, so we take, I mean, maybe I forgot to mention, so now one data element is measurement of all those operators in one state, and now different elements are measurements in, in different states with supposedly similar uh, complexity. And then we train it, on, on part of, of those uh, states and measurements in it, and then test it on the unseen um, uh, part. And we will call um, the test error uh, essentially in this function. So how far is this reconstruction here of our measurements from the initial input measurements? Uh, and this will kind of tell us whether uh, the bottleneck is wide enough. All right, and um, kind of through this first part, I'll guide us through these different stages, but we'll first benchmark this approach on, um, let's say, the simplest uh, stage, and this is this late stage when we expect um, the, the system to be describable by some ensembles, uh, meaning just with a few Lagrange parameters uh, or, or just with the temperature. But we will not do like a real time evolution to start with, but we'll just first benchmark. So we'll take a Hamiltonian, let's say a transverse field easing, and we'll just you know, prepare uh, thermal states with respect to this Hamiltonian where we randomly sample the temperature. And then in such a state, we measure all these different uh, observables and first check whether our uh, autoencoder uh, figures out that these measurements are actually parameterized with a single parameter, uh, and that is temperature. And uh, what we first do is that we look at the test error. So we compare how good is this reconstruction of the input measurement at a different um, number of neurons in the latent space. And we see that this error, or this test error, drops already when I have at least one neuron uh, here in the bottleneck, which is an agreement, or, or I mean, which tells us, and then it kind of flattens off, maybe improves a little bit, but essentially it's flat. So it tells us that indeed the uh, successful reconstruction happens as long as we have at least one neuron in the bottleneck, related to the fact that this data was indeed parameterized just with a single parameter. So it's kind of doing the job uh, that we expected. 
Um, now it's also nice, so if we look at how does this input data, which is what's like this high dimensional vector, where does it map to here in the latent space? And uh, this is what I'm showing here. So, you know, one, I mean, yeah, so, so one uh, set of measurements at a given temperature would be mapped here, another one there. Uh, but uh, when I look uh, at this latent representation of my data set, I see that it's one dimensional, which is again in agreement with the fact that uh, what the autoencoder is seeing are just thermal measurements at different temperatures. Uh, and, and we see that like here I color coded these different points um, according to the temperature of the state from which the data is coming or, or the energy. And we see that it's indeed, you know, ordered monotonically with respect to the corresponding uh, energy. Yes. So we put all um, Pauli strings uh, of uh, yeah, local uh, Pauli operators up to support three. No, ma many. X, Y, Z, let's say uh, 64 of them for support three. I mean, a bit less because we remove those with identities at the edges, but roughly uh, kind of four to S operators. So this, this input is really high dimensional, and then this is you know, mapped to some lower dimensional representation. Uh, so it's, then these are measured with respect to your state. So let's say I would take a trace, I mean, trace of your operator with respect to rho. And then I take, let's say first, as I said, x, and then the second one, y, and so on. So all these are input then to my, uh, but they are not stochastic. I mean, it's like for a given state, or which can be pure, or I'll also do some open systems, maybe mixed or thermal, uh, but it's just a measurement in this state. Yes. Yeah, that's like it was disconnected and then essentially what it kind of learns is the average. Uh, so, I mean, wh why, you know, why it's not that bad, even if it doesn't know anything, it tells us that because a lot of, uh, let's say, inputs were quite small, so let maybe the average of those measurements is... Uh, yes, they are, like, disconnected, so it kind of best, I mean, what you would learn, I mean, okay, what would you input, yeah, if you wouldn't, no, yeah, wouldn't connect. And, yeah, and, and then we can also a bit like we can check what is the value of this neuron uh, here, let's say in relation to the temperature, I mean, does it l pick exactly the temperature of, of my states? And the answer is no. So let's say here in red is the value uh, of, uh, on this. Let's say if I had just a single neuron in the latent space, that would be the value on it. And you just see that it is an invertible function of, of temperature plotted in black, but it's not exactly it, which kind of makes sense. So it's, can, it should just only be bijectively related to it, but not necessarily the same. And then we went on and also, okay, looked at what if we don't have just a single, uh, I mean, not a thermal state, but we add additional conserved quantities, and that is kind of super easy uh, for the model that we consider because transfers field easing model is actually integrable, so it has macroscopically many conserved quantities. So we could have put here macroscopically many additional Lagrange multipliers, and that would be 
um, yeah, uh, where all of those uh, uh, Cs, uh, which are the conserved quantities of the model, would uh, commute. But here we add just one of it, so this was Hamiltonian, and then we added one more. Um, just to check that whether the autoencoder then figures out that now our state is parameterized with two parameters, and that is indeed what happens. Now the test error drops uh, when I have at least two neurons in the latent space and then levels off. Uh, and, and if we look now, like we did here for the latent representation in that case, I mean, it looks, maybe it's a bit hard to say that it looks <laughs> two-dimensional because it maybe looks also a bit 1D-ish, but um, while, it sh I mean, or, or while, yeah, according to this, it should be two-dimensional, but it, it still, um, the message is that when we look at how, uh, I mean, how this ordering is performed in that case, we still see that one direction is spent by the Hamiltonian expectation values and the perpendicular uh, to the, um, to, to the, yeah, uh, to the second conserved quantity. So, uh, yeah, the message being that, uh, yeah, the, it works well. But now let's, I mean, this was really benchmarking, so sending it measurement with respect to this synthetically prepared state with randomly uh, sampled lambda one and lambda two. Now let's go to more uh, realistic situation. And that is uh, the following. So, I mean, we could have done a quench, but since I am ki kind of quite fond of open systems, we did a bit of a variant of it. So we've performed evolution with respect to some Hamiltonian and then added uh, which was fixed, and then added a little bit of coupling to the baths, which I don't know if you're familiar it, with it, but I mean, uh, which can be described with so-called Limblad operators, so these are those LK, uh, such that the evolution of the state is described by this mixed density matrix that follows this Leuvillian equation. And what we know uh, from some other works, uh, also including myself, is that if this coupling to bath is very weak, then the steady states are of this form that we just described. So if this evolution with Hamiltonian is chaotic, then we are relaxing to a thermal state, plus some corrections which are regulated by how weak is our coupling to the bath. While if this Hamiltonian is integrable, like it was our transverse field easing model, then it actually re uh, relaxes to a generalized Gibbs ensemble uh, described with additional uh, Lagrange uh, multipliers for these additional conserved quantities of our integrable Hamiltonian, again, plus some corrections. So what we did is that indeed we performed like time evolution with a fixed Hamiltonian and then prepare different states by kind of taking different weak couplings to baths which were encoded in different, essentially randomly rotated single and two side Limblad operators. And then we wanted to, and then we went to analyze now this physical uh, uh, density matrix corresponding to the steady state. Uh, and that's what we got. So we first look at the test error, which should tell us now how many parameters we need to describe this state. And somehow if our Hamiltonian was chaotic and we should be relaxing close to a thermal state, we got that we needed essentially one, two um, latent variables to describe kind of statistically all of these different steady states obtained by slightly different uh, Limblad operators. While if uh, integrable Hamiltonian was, uh, if Hamiltonian was integrable, we needed more. But because we were measuring, you know, here only operators up to support three, it turned out that we didn't need like a crazy amount of, of uh, latent variables, maybe only like four, uh, which means that even though like we know that the state should relax to a GGE parameterized with macroscopically many Lagrange parameters, if we are measuring only at maybe up to three sites, we don't see the importance of the higher 
uh, more complicated conserved quantities, but we only s roughly see the importance of the most local conserved uh, quantities. And once again, if we look uh, at this latent representation, so how the data looks here in the latent space, we saw that for chaotic Hamiltonian, that should lead to a nearly thermal state, the data was once again uh, almost, let's say approximately one dimensionally ordered, uh, and that ordering was once again with respect to the energy. While for this other situation with integrable Hamiltonian, where we said that we needed, uh, that the data was ordered in, let's say, some four dimensional manifold, if we mapped it to 2D with Tisney, we saw such representations where once again, let's say, the dominant primary direction was spent by the expectation value of Hamiltonian, and then the next one with some linear combination of Hamiltonian and the most local um, parity even conserved quantity. So, so we nicely saw that really these conserved quantities are the ones that are spanning this latent representation. Now, um, if we go a little bit back to this chaotic example and try to think, okay, where does this spread comes from? I mean, it must come from these corrections above the simple thermal state. And, and in this case, different steady states were performed um, by, you know, kind of randomly, uh, by like coupling to baths represented with two side and one side limblets, which were kind of randomly rotated sigma x times projection down and a randomly rotated projection up. And it turns out that in this case, the autoencoder figure out that the only direction which is not rotated is sigma z. So this spread was actually given by the z correlators, uh, which a bit tells us, uh, let's say if you had kind of a simulator, you did many runs, you saw it's not perfect, so it has some noise. So then the, such an analysis could tell you, uh, I mean, what kind of correlations this noise is uh, promoting. And, and this got, we then pushed it a little bit and, and said, okay, let's now really look at the coupling to the bath, which is promoting a certain correlation, which is more obvious. For example, by choosing limblats, which are flipping your uh, spin on side i up if the spin on side i plus one is down and now all these other symmetric combinations and, and then just giving them some random weight. In which case really the bath was proposing, uh, was promoting antiferromagnetic xx correlations and then we nicely saw that the secondary direction was exactly spent by this kind of um, correlations. All right, uh, so in that sense, we could at least have a bit of an, uh, a feeling of what, um, what might be, uh, I mean, what kind of noise might be polluting our data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it would, so it would happen that these points would lie uh, elsewhere, but if, like features like this one that you have kind of one, you know, direction spent with, let's say, Hamiltonian, and then the second one with your second conserved quantity, that should remain. So I think this cloud would change, but this, this fact um, that, uh, I mean, these different directions are related to, to the like say your most important and second and so on, a latent neuron should be still visible. True, and I mean, let's say also these shapes that I was showing here was done in the same way and let's say this star would change into something else uh, so one shouldn't, yeah, I think 
of course, there are regions where it's somehow, uh, you know, where it's meaning, or where it looks similar, but I, I still think that unless you, you know, okay, unless you do something crazy, uh, this ordering, I mean, or, or these interpretations can be done. Or perhaps what we start the little bit of um, making this more precise where we were going towards variational autoencoders, where this ordering was not, was kind of yeah, more, uh, I mean, aligned, uh, but that we didn't feel, like we never really pushed it to publication quality. Uh, if we did just a simple PCA, on the data, oh, yeah, on the latent space, maybe then, yes, maybe one could do it in a sense of once you already have the compressed representation, uh, probably this primary direction should pop out there as well. Okay, and what I wanted to say is that, okay, if I crank up this coupling to the bath to be very strong, when no emergent descri simple description of those states uh, can be formed, then we got, I mean, then we saw that we needed, we would need much larger latent representation and there was no nice, let's say, uh, you know, latent illustration of your data anymore, telling us that then these states are really uh, kind of strongly dissipated or dependent. Okay, and in the, then finally we went for this um, time evolution. So let's say if we start from an initial state, can we use this approach to detect this growth and decay of complexity? But here I should be uh, kind of honest. I mean, I cheated a little bit. So if we would really prepare the state in a product state and then just evolve it with some Hamiltonian, autoencoder would know that our state was prepared in a, say, two-dimensional uh, manifold, and then it would just, I mean, uh, Hamiltonian is just mapping it to something else, so uh, we would never see this growth of complexity. So this is only possible uh, once we introduced uh, some randomness, for example, by pre-propagating the state with random unitaries which then differ from time to time. But we still imposed one conservation, that is magnetization conservation, such that at long times we were still uh, flowing to essentially like non-trivial kind of Gibbs ensemble characterized with uh, chemical potential for magnetization. And here is what we then got, so yeah, because we prepare the system in different product state parameterized with two angles, the autoencoder nicely saw that essentially we need two latent variables to represent that. Okay, at long times, as I said, we were running into uh, like a state that was locally described with an ensemble parameterized with the one chemical potential. So we needed just one uh, variable uh, to uh, yeah, represent uh, that Lagrange multiplier, but at kind of some intermediate times, we saw, uh, I mean, okay, what I'm plotting here is the test error, kind of color-coded as a function of time and number of latent variables. We saw this growth and decay of complexity for uh, now also, again, this case, observables on, on support uh, three which, uh, okay, what it told us that, I mean, it could help us identify on which time scales this so-called hydrodynamic regime for which we can build effective classical description uh, start to appear. Uh, and it helped us, you know, extract this information from, let's say, the bunch of observables that we had. Yes? Uh, initial states are different product states which are translationally invariant. So Parameterized, right, with two angles of those spin. So why 
Yeah, I mean, it's this effect, you know, that we always see, let's say that it's not, it's always drifts a bit down, but let's say, I mean, it's a bit hard to see, still the major drop in that case it is at two. Um, yeah, on this plot is a bit hard to, yeah. But yeah, you, you, you do see this, that here you need two, here you need one, and in between uh, you have this information bottleneck uh, where the state really gets uh, hard to represent uh, and uh, where people have been really trying to put forward some numerical techniques trying to overcome this, this um, barrier here uh, that emerges in a subsystem dynamics only. Okay, uh, and now uh, and I mean, so far we didn't manage to really put forward a technique. We only essentially put forward an, a way to detect it and possibly try to ask yourself whether now you can detect, uh, I mean, reconstruct these effective uh, um, equations of motion. But um, then, I mean, we went further. I mean, can we now harness this to do some sort of Hamiltonian reconstruction if you're given, let's say, just a bunch of observables. Uh, and at least in the case where uh, we, the autoencoder tells us that these observables are coming from different thermal or at least nearly thermal states, when this latent uh, space is ordered with respect to the uh, energy or Hamiltonian expectation value, then even, then we can use that. I mean, even if we don't know, let's say, the Hamiltonian uh, that produced these expectation values, uh, it will hold that not only Hamiltonian, but also other observables that we do have, will have a strong variation uh, along this um, latent uh, representation. So we, what we did is that essentially we said, okay, let's just look at the average gradient of the observables that we have along this manifold and pick the ones that have the largest um, gradient and take those as uh, kind of trial Hamiltonian terms uh, for my unknown Hamiltonian. And then we fix these uh, weights by comparing uh, our trial thermal states, because we know that, I mean, that these measurements are coming from thermal states because the representation is one dimensional, to the actual measurements. And then, I mean, if, essentially, if we have measured all observables uh, or terms of the Hamiltonian, in that way we are done. We, we, we got it, okay, up to a prefactor, which can be fixed as I'll tell later. I mean, if we are, actually dealing with a long-range Hamiltonian, but we are only measuring part of its terms, and we are trying to propose some kind of uh, approximate, short-term uh, approximation to it, then it turns out that, I mean, in, in that way, maybe some uh, ghost terms creep in, and we can get rid of those by looking at the variation of these coefficients at different measurements, get rid of those, and, and, and repeat it. And, uh, okay, and essentially now what we did is that we, well, we applied this approach to a few cases. So as I said, now if I measure all terms that actually appear in my Hamiltonian, this approach will work well and I'll essentially, you know, I'll reconstruct it successfully. If I'm dealing with a long range Hamiltonian, but I measure just the most local observables, and I'm essentially trying to, you know, approximate it now with some uh, local one, it will, well, it will be approximation, right? Um, but still, I mean, we can check how bad it is. So let's say I consider as my Hamiltonian that I'm after this such an XY model with power law decaying interactions. What I find out that this procedure, uh, I mean, we, if I look at the relative error of uh, these coefficients uh, with support L, so one, two, three, and so on. The error is pretty small at the dominant terms and it gets larger at the, uh, like the terms with larger support, but because these have 
smaller mm, kind of weights, turns out it's not so important in practice. So let's say if I compare evolution of my actual Hamiltonian and my reconstructed one, it will be very good at short times, then it starts to deviate, but these deviations are in our case where we do some ED kind of amplified by finite size effects. So anyway, I expect here that I would just see a plateau and all these fluctuations are more or less finite size fluctuations. Yeah, and this, how in this, thank you, it depends very much on delta. So the more um, larger is the delta, so more, you know, kind of suppressed our long term uh, um, contributions, then the smaller are the errors, as well as like the larger, you know, access we have. So if you are measuring all up to support four is worse than up to support six. So, so the more information we have from measurements, the better. On the dynamics plot, yeah, I think it was the, uh, sorry, I think it was the two, but I can uh, check. Yeah, it was one of those two. Um, right, but why, I mean, why bother? Uh, so we thought, okay, let's do something uh, interesting with it. And one case where we sometimes really do not know the effective model is when we are considering uh, periodic driving. So when, for example, your Hamiltonian is periodic uh, with some time t, or maybe your time propagator is periodic. Uh, and what we know is if, if the frequency of the drive is very high and the system has hard time, you know, absorbing this large energy that we try to put in, so what will happen is that on a pretty long window of essentially exponentially up to exponential times that are exponentially long in this high frequency, the system will look like thermal uh, with respect to so-called Floquet Hamiltonian, which can be, in this case, of high frequencies, for example, obtained with some um, perturbative approaches like Magnus expansion in, in one over frequency. But then at later times, the system eventually, I mean, is able, I mean, start to absorb and heat up to the infinite uh, temperature, and it's much less known of what is happening now in this regime, where these uh, perturbative expansions break down. And that's what we've been interested in. So, I mean, we first again benchmark, uh, that's how our approach uh, on the example where we have a clear uh, thermal plateau. So, for example, our propagation for time t was done by H1 for half a period and H2 for the other half. When, for the parameters we chose, we have like a clear plateau. Um, I mean, shown here in blue for the exact. And here we first compared, let's say, some BCH. This is one of these expansions up to the third order or our reconstruction, including uh, also operators up to support three, which is the same as the order that we considered. And okay, what we see is that neither our reconstruction nor the BCH is perfect, so they all slightly deviate from it because in both cases we are reconstructing this kind of long-range Hamiltonian with some uh, finite, I mean, short-range one. And plus we are doing this reconstruction from the data that is polluted by finite size effects and this kind of wiggles in time, which I guess makes our method Slight, maybe even slightly worse than the BCH one, but roughly they are uh, kind of comparable. Like if I look really at the weights at different terms, they are quite similar. So let's say at least we are roughly um, happy with what uh, we are getting. So then we can go on and, and kind of go into the wild and try to reconstruct now some effective Hamiltonian, or I see, I mean, what's happening after we, I mean, after we are away from this simple thermal plateau. And what was uh, already proposed by Marin and his collaborator earlier was that, I mean, that also in this regime, the state should remain thermal, but with some, you know, unknown Hamiltonian. So we first wanted to test that, 
So we were essentially you know, feeding now into our autoencoder measurements at these different times here in the heating regime and first check uh, what is the dimension, I mean, what is, what's happening with the test error. And what we see is that, I mean, maybe not for the short times, I mean, here is the actual data that we then um, uh, measured from, except for the short times, which maybe still remember of the initial state, which was some randomly rotated thermal one, but at least then at later times, we saw, see a clear one-dimensional uh, latent representation again, which then also in the latent, really in the latent space looked like that, which first of all told us that data is really still thermal in the heating regime. All right, and now, okay, under this knowledge that it's a, a thermal state, we went on to try to reconstruct this Hamiltonian, and okay, what we saw from that analysis is that uh, as time progresses, this Hamiltonian becomes less and less uh, local. So here I'm comparing, you know, the average coefficient at support two, three, and four, five, compared to the dominant, which is one. And I see that as time progresses, these less local terms are essentially picking up uh, on the, the importance. And apparently this heat now, we, and this kind of gave us some intuition that this heating is happening through uh, this effective Hamiltonian becoming less and less local up to the point where I guess it becomes non-local and we enter into this infinite temperature uh, state. I'm running a bit late, but we repeated this same uh, procedure also for so-called multipolar drives when I'm randomly combining, you know, a sequence of some U dagger and U, mi uh, U, U plus and U minus or the other way, but essentially here really w the, the, the type of effective states is completely unknown, but our analysis at least show that in this heating regime, also for this other type of driving, the same uh, is uh, happening. And with that, um, okay, I'm down to conclusion. So we've used neural network to try to achieve some compressed representation of uh, measurements in quantum states, so as to extract some uh, kind of typical non-equilibrium dynamics features, pot potentially the noise that's polluting our uh, simulator or the effective Hamiltonian uh, uh, describing these states. Um, let me just maybe highlight the poster of Gianluca Lanese, who's more talking about what we do now, and this is using uh, POVM uh, representation of density matrix to be captured by uh, steady states for um, describing light matter coupled uh, open uh, systems. And uh, yeah, let me also say that, I mean, in my group, we have PhD in postdoc positions. So if you are interested to join, uh, just let me know. And with that, I uh, conclude. Hey, thanks, Salah, for the interesting talk. Is there further question? Yeah. Okay, everything works. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think that maybe measuring even more operators could make it sharper. I mean, we were also playing a little bit with, I mean, maybe I have here, let's say, you know, with the number of samples and uh, the number of um, neurons you have per layer. So this, uh, the first one was like, like, you know, going from two to 400 neurons in a layer, but was maybe making a little bit sharper, but not too much. Same with the number of samples. Uh, it's also, I mean, yeah, it's a bit, um, yeah, not so 
so clear that it's helping. So probably if you really wanted to have this more sharp variation, autoencoders are maybe a better choice when you then look at you know, how strong is the variation uh, per each. Uh, and, and there you should see that the, you know, on your like, telling neuron, it's slow. And on the random neurons, it's essentially very high. So maybe it's, it's a better way to make it uh, sharper. It would be possible to generalize this for when your data set is not expectation values, but it's uh, more like snapshots uh, of a quantum state. Uh. Yeah, we've been a bit thinking along this direction. Uh, and I mean, I, <laughs> I didn't do anything, but I guess that indeed, um, perhaps I, I, I believe it should work. But maybe there also going for uh, kind of the variational autoencoders would be uh, the way to go because then kind of this probabilistic maybe nature can help you, uh, you know, overcome uh, this difference uh, and yeah, try to maybe even from snapshots perform, uh, extract some sort of, you know, if you find that your measurements are thermal, even use it to maybe produce uh, measurements. It was not, I mean, I think uh, maybe Marcus, you can comment. It was not ex. I mean, what in that sense? If it's it, if it's a measure of the variance of your um, measurements, in some sense, it's also can be like I guess uh, related to like I don't know if you would sample from hotter states where you have smaller. I mean, it's all all variant, all values are pretty small anyway. I mean, if your density matrix is nearly uh, identity and you have, okay, uh, then the all values are small. So I guess then this error you would get would also be smaller than if you sample from something where they vary more strongly. So in that sense, maybe yes, or depending on your Hamiltonian, you know, we, how many operators actually have a thermal expectation value, it can tell you also a bit on the Hamiltonian, right? Because like, I mean, which, uh, which operators are finite in a thermal state depends on your Hamiltonian. <laughs> Your questions? Not let thanks again, Zala.